thank you and thank you very much for the invitation. So I will be speaking uh, about the joint work with uh, Michael Chapman. Okay, so the general question, um, which was asked in, uh, in 1941 by Ulam, it's a very general question. Is every approximate homomorphism from a group gamma to a group G close to a homomorphism? Um, so of course, this is uh, not a specific question. And the answer depends on what, what are the groups gamma and G? What do we mean by approximate homomorphism? And what do we mean by close to a, a homomorphism? Let's start with an example of a theorem that gives a positive answer to a question of this sort. So here the group gamma is an amenable group. If you don't recall what it is, you can think about an abelian group. You just think of Z squared, it's already interesting, um, or any solvable group. The group G, the domain, the target group is uh, U of uh, some Hilbert space, so the unitary operators on some Hilbert space. Um, and the theorem says the following, if a function F from gamma to the unitary operators, that's fast. Do you see my cursor, my pointer? Yeah, yeah, we see. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so if f of gamma one, gamma two, for every pair of elements of the group, minus f of gamma one, f of gamma two, is very small in the operator norm, uniformly over all pairs of elements. So this is what I would call, if f satisfies this condition, an approximate homomorphism, so f of gamma one, gamma two is close to f of gamma one, f of gamma two, then there is a representation, a true group homomorphism from gamma to the unitary operators on H, such that the difference between this homomorphism and F on each element in operator norm is at most twice delta. Okay, so in the context, functions form an amenable group to the groups to the group of unitary operators on the Hilbert space, the answer is yes. Every approximate homomorphism is close to a homomorphism. So where, where, does, where is this constant coming from? One over 200? Uh, where, where exactly does it come from? Um, I don't think it's time, I mean, it's just, if you, if you want to get this delta to be delta and two delta, then you have one over 200. Otherwise, you just get a, a larger constant. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have a good answer. Okay. Okay. In this talk, we're going to do something uh, a bit different. Um, instead of the unitary group um, and the operator norm, we take the symmetric group as the target group. And our metric on the symmetric group is the normalized Hamming metric. The distance between two permutations, sigma and tau, is computed as follows. I look at every point x in the numbers one to n, such that sigma and tau disagree. I count the number of such points and normalize by dividing by n. The distance is always between zero and one. And this is the zero, the distance between sigma and tau. Okay, so it's just um, an up between zero and one that tells me the fraction of disagreement between sigma and tau. Now I want to formalize um, and have some notation for approximate uh, homomorphisms and something that will help me to say what close to homo homomorphism is. So if I have a function f from gamma, um, from now on, it will be useful to think of gamma as a countable group, any countable group. This will be my focus. So if I have 
function f from gamma to sim n, the uniform local defect is just the supremum of the distance between f gamma 1 gamma 2 and f gamma 1 f gamma 2 running over all pairs gamma 1 gamma 2 in gamma. The word uniform here comes from the fact that I'm taking the supremum. And if I have two functions, f and h, from gamma to a symmetric group, the uniform distance between them is just going over all group elements, taking the distance between f gamma and h gamma, um, and taking the supremum of all of those distances. And here's a basic theorem um, that, again, gives a positive, positive uh, stability result um, to an instance of Ulan's question. If the group gamma is finite and I have a function f from gamma to a symmetric group, then there is a homomorphism gamma to sim n, h from gamma to sim n, such that the distance between this homomorphism and the given function is for some constant times the, um, the, the uniform local defect of F. So if the uniform local defect of F is small, there is a homomorphism H close to F in the uniform distance. And the crucial point here is that this constant C depends only on the group gamma and not on N. So it's the same bound even if the symmetric group is very, very large. Now, this theorem, it was not phrased in this context. It was phrased in the context of some other type of stability that I will discuss later. Um, but, uh, but this is an equivalent form of, of the theorem of Klebskin Rivera. And this is not a very, a very difficult theorem. Um, but uh, the paper had some uh, foundational importance. This is the same theorem, I'm just keeping it on the slide. Um, and I want to present two questions. One question of Lubosky: does the theorem remain true if I replace gamma, which is the finite group in the Klebsky rivera theorem, with the integers, Z? The same thing, is it true for the integers? And the second question, in the Klebsky rivera theorem, the constant C here, did not depend on n, but it did depend on the domain group gamma. So the question is, is the one C that works for all finite groups? At the end of the talk, I, I will explain a little bit why, why it is important to have a C that depends only on, that is universal and does not depend on gamma. But for now, I will tell you, mostly on the next slide, why the answers are no, this theorem as it is, if you replace gamma by z, it's not true. And no, um, you cannot take C to be a universal constant. It must depend on the domain group gamma. Does it depend on the domain? But if you only restrict on the number of generators, let's say you only take two generated finite groups. Um, no, it will see, okay, you, so the answer is still now and you will see, you will see for really the next slide. What? Sorry, sorry. My, my question is whether this number C grows with the number of generators of the group or with the size of the group? So the size of the group. So even two generated groups will give me big C. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's, see, let's see this theorem on this slide and it will help us discuss this. Okay. Um, so the theorem is general. Um, maybe think about gamma equal to Z to begin with. So if gamma acts transitively on the numbers one to N, um, certainly for Z it's true for every N, then there is a function F from gamma to seem n minus one, so one point less, such that the uniform local defect is very small, but um, 
the, the distance from every homomorphism is not close to zero. So here I write, it's, uh, it's actually close to one half. Um, yeah. So in particular, so, okay, so, so this says that um, Z, because Z has uh, transitive actions on, on one to N for arbitrary large N, actually for every N, then you can, uh, you can see that even if this it becomes very, very small when you take N very large, uh, the distance to every homomorphism uh, will uh, still be bounded away from zero. Um, and if gamma is finite, answering your question, then you can get the defect very close to zero um, because you can take the, the action of the finite group on itself by left multiplication. Um, so you can get here two over the size of the group minus one, uh, but the defect here would be close to zero. So yeah, it, it does, in the case of a final group, it does depend on the size of the group. And I will not really give you the proof, but I will just tell you what the construction is uh, because it helps me motivate uh, the next slide. So what I do, I take this transitive action of gamma uh, on the numbers one to n. So this is a homomorphism from gamma to sin n. And I compose a restriction map from sim n to sim n minus one. So this is just a function. The restriction map of sigma, so res n sigma, sigma was a permutation in sim n and res n of sigma is a permutation in sim n minus one. So when res n of sigma acts on x, it does the following. If sigma, the original sigma of x was not n, then res n sigma just acts like sigma. And if sigma x was n, res n of sigma cannot act like sigma because in this, because res n of sigma is a permutation on one to n minus one. And therefore it acts like by doing sigma twice. So it bypasses s. Okay, so this is just a very, very simple construction. Uh, and it's quite easy to see that the local Could defect is very, very small. N with uh, the preimage of n? Sorry? Res is uh, you gluing n with the preimage of n in some sense? Um, Oh, I think uh, you take the you take the second structure and you just remove n when you write your formula. Yes, you yes, that's right. You, you take, remove you n. The cycle structure. You take the cycle structure, you remove n, and then the element that went into n now goes where into where n went. Yeah, so it okay. just bypasses n. But it's the same as gluing uh, n with the preimage. But whatever. Yeah. Um, no, n is now a fixed point. No, n is not a fixed one because it's removed. Now I'm in sim n minus one. Okay. Right. Um, is it gluing? Well, it depends on what, what you do with the, and, and maybe. No, 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 no. They're moving a double edge. I didn't understand the beginning, now I understand. Okay, okay. okay. So this is a, a very simple construction and it's, it, it's quite easy to see that the uh, uniform local defect will be very small because all I did is I took a genuine homomorphism and I made this tiny, tiny change. Um, and it is uh, slightly more tricky to see that now there is no nearby homomorphism. And this is where the transitivity comes into play. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the proof, but the point is that transitive actions are separated from each other. They are far away from each other. So um, a transitive action on n elements cannot be close to any action on n minus one elements. This is the, the one sentence intuition. Um, but what I want to take from here is that, okay, so this gives a very negative answer to the questions uh, presented in the previous slide about Z and about uh, finite groups, but it is a little disappointing because this construction, um, is just taking um, an, a homomorphism and just deforming it a bit. So the only way, only reason that this 
function f is not close to homomorphism is because our rules for what we mean when you say close to a homomorphism do not allow us to add the point back, right? If we were allowed to take this function f from gamma to sigma n minus one and add a point to make it a function from f to sim n and then change it a bit to be a homomorphism, then certainly this construction would not show instability because I could just add the point that I removed and undo this little change. So here is the relaxed question. Is f to sim n close to a homomorphism h from gamma to sim capital N? But explain what I mean. I need to explain how. Oh, I and your, your connection is not so good. Can you, is there anything you can do? Um, you, okay, occasionally you are broken. Um, let me talk to my router. <laughs> okay. It's not only me, right? Everyone. What did it say? Um, it doesn't it respond. Uh, it, do, you, do you hear me now? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it does nothing to do. We can hear you just occasionally, you, you, you can't hear you, but uh, usually it's fine. Just go on. If there is no easy solution, just go on. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, but uh, yeah, keep asking questions. So I know that I'm not disconnecting and speaking with myself. Yeah, so I have a question before you proceed. So yes. let's say that instead of this permutation uh, representation, we're looking at the unitary representation. Yes. Do you still see the same phenomenon as in the previous theorem? Or um, So the, the answer is, um, well, for well, the I still operator- still that dimension, right? For the operator norm, no, uh, no, no. I mean, you're okay. You can you can correct it. Um, but for the normalized Hilbert-Schmidt norm, you see the same phenomenon, and I will show it uh, very soon. So it depends on the norm on U M. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the question now is: every approximate homomorphism into sim n close to homomorphism into sim capital N. Okay, and here's a. A theorem uh, that also answers uh, answers uh, Alexei's an instance of Alexei's question: If gamma is an amenable group and f is a function from gamma to U n, so yeah, here I'm in finite dimensions, um, and f of gamma one gamma two is close to f gamma one f gamma two in the normalized Hilbert Schmidt norm. So the normalized Hilbert-Schmidt norm, it's indicated here below. Um, and all it is, is you take, you take um, a matrix A, you sum the squares of its entries, um, you divide by N and then you take the square root. So it's kind of a normalized L2 norm. And there is a representation H from gamma to UN, so capital N here, uh, which is a little larger than, than little m, and an isometry from Cn to Cn, such that H and F um, after this isometry are very, very close. So again, I have a linear dependence on uh, between approximate homomorphism and uh, how close the actual homomorphism is. So here I have um, a positive solution. And the reason that um, they, this, that theorem is here increases n is because as is shown in the paper of Gauss and Khatami, you must increase the dimension. Otherwise you can do a construction similar uh, to the construction that I showed you before to increase the dimension by one and then uh, 
the, then you will, you will get uh, again that you have, um, if you start with an irreducible representation and you decrease the dimension by one, uh, then you get something which is not close to a true representation unless you can increase the dimension back. Um, so in the previous slide, I took a transitive action. And here, if you want to do the same thing, uh, you need to take an irreducible representation and then decrease the dimension. Uh, and the same thing uh, works with the difference. Could you confirm that you're hearing me because Zoom is again complaining? Yeah, yeah, we hear it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to do the same kind of thing for um, permutations. So I need to define the way that I'm measuring a distance between two permutations. I have now sigma um, in sim m and tau in sim capital M. And so the distance between them is going to be, first look at this. This is just the size of the set of disagreement. Again, this n in brackets is the numbers one to n. But now I'm adding to this set of disagreement the difference between capital N and N, and then normalize. Okay, so the, there is a punishment in distance if the permutations live in symmetric groups of very different sizes. But if the sizes are uh, close together, then, um, then the distance is mostly determined by the set of disagreements. It's and just you can check embedding uh, on the first letters. It's by embedding on the first letters and con considering the the next letters as uh, disagreement. Yes. Uh, even if tau well, is trivial on the next letters, you still uh, take it as different. Yes, if sigma is not it's defined exactly somewhere and tau is defined somewhere, then I say that they disagree though. So the difference between the trivial element to the trivial element is not zero. Yes, that's right. It's, um, it's whatever. The yeah. difference divided by capital M. Okay, thanks. And you can check that this is a metric. I mean, it's the only thing that is slightly non-trivial is that it's the triangle inequality, but it's still not hard. Um, okay. And now I'm just redefining but it's a bit strange that you take the disjoint union or, and not uh, and not the direct limit. So I mean, it would just the direct limit, then you you would like to to embed uh, sim n and sim two n by two copies or something like that. I guess uh, it will just give you something else, a different concept. Yeah, but why this distance? Is there a reason why this distance makes sense? No, it would be zero always if you took the direct limit. So yeah, that yes. is the most natural thing. To why, why? Why? I didn't understand. Because you're dividing by n. So if you're taking a limit, I guess the distance would be zero. Um. So the thing is that this distance, um, another thing I could do is not have this punishment here, but just whenever I'm looking for a nearby homomorphism to require capital N to be close to N. Um, but here I just, the distance itself encapsulates the fact that the, the N and N. In, in the close. theorem that you mentioned before with the dimension shifts, you add that this T star, yeah, T star F T. So uh, maybe you should. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to understand the definition. Maybe it should be something like this because it's a sub. In a sense, it's a subspace. So you need to embed S N into S capital N, and and then you have this difference, no? Or it doesn't work that maybe. But I mean, here, here you get this distance because. Right, because H of gamma is in a here you here if you look if you think about it as matrices and you have many zeros uh, which will might correspond to a difference here. Okay. 
The reason that I'm doing this is that the way I like to think about it is how many changes do I need to, to perform on sigma to make it, to change it, to deform it into tau. So a change can be changing an entry of the permutation or adding a point. So this is just a measure of how many small changes I need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and so now I'm defining the distance between two functions, um, which is just uh, the same as it was before, but I'm just redefining it now because we have uh, a notion of function from gamma to sim n and from gamma to sim capital N. And so the distance between functions is just defined the same, but with this new notion of distance between two And here's a question of, of Kuhn and Tom, they have a finite group gamma and a function from gamma to sin n. So this is uh, the same setting as in the glevsky rivera theorem. And they are asking whether there is a homomorphism H from gamma to sin capital N, such that capital N is just a bit smaller than the original N and they are close. This epsilon must only depend on the uniform local defect, right? So this was the supremum of f gamma had f gamma one gamma two minus f gamma one f gamma two, um, and of course I require it to go to zero when the defect goes to zero. So it's the same question as the one answered by Glebsky and Rivera, only that. Uh, I am allowed to increase the dimension. And the answer, joint work with uh, Michael Chapman, is yes, in a strong way. I don't need to, def to have gamma a finite group. It holds for every amenable group. And the second thing is that this dependence between epsilon and the uniform local defect is linear. So epsilon is at most some, this is the constant that we get in the proof. It's you can make it 2021. Uh, yes, it will, yes. But, uh, but uh, it's from 2020, uh, there is also, mm. uh, yeah, and we did not want to commemorate this year. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so, and so this is a, a linear, uh, a linear dependence. But you can also think about it, not just as an answer to this question of Kuhn and Tom, but also we had Lubowski's answer question before about the group Z. And we said that it had a negative answer, but this was only because we were not allowed to increase N. Now that we are allowed to increase N, then this theorem gives us uh, a positive result, all four falls in. So this is a constant, so no dependence on the group, and in particular, it holds for it. Here's the theorem uh, slightly more precisely. Let gamma be in a minimal group and f a function from gamma to sin n. Then there is a homomorphism h from gamma to sin capital N such that the distance between the homomorphism and the given function is at most this constant times the uniform local defect. And um, capital N is just slightly smaller than N. Um, so I am adding this condition here that N, capital N is just slightly smaller than N, mostly for emphasis. And also for this constant, which is slightly better than what you would get just from the very fact that they are close, a uh, definition of distance says that capital N must not be much larger than N. I'm just reminding you here that it's not much larger. And I will sketch the proof, um, or at least give you the very basic idea, uh, because this proof is, is too much to, to be given in a, in a talk. Um, I fix a finitely additive left invariant probability measure or finitely additive 
qualitative left invariant probability measure on the group gamma. Um, here I just recall how to construct such an object if you're not familiar with the minimal groups. So let's say in the example of the group gamma being the integers, uh, you can construct such a measure by saying that the measure of a subset A of the integers is computed by taking the intersection of A with, um, with the interval between minus N and N, taking its size, normalizing. So 2N plus one is just the size of this interval, the integers between minus N and N, and then taking the limit. So this is the type of, of density. Um, if this limit exists, then I can say that this is the measure of A. Uh, and so this is a par partially defined uh, measure on the integers. And then you can use the axiom of choice to, uh, to extend M to a finitely editable probability measures on all subsets. And the point of this measure is that it is left invariant. So left invariant means that M of gamma A is equal to M of A. Um, and uh, this is the point that this measure is not just a finite additive probability measure, it also interacts with the group. Um, and an amenable group, by definition, is a group that admits a finitely additive left invariant probability measure. So this is the first thing, just fix such a measure. The second thing is to consider the following graph. So we are given a function f from gamma to sin m, and we think about it as a graph, as, as follows. The, the vertices of this graph is the numbers one to n, and the edges are as follows. For every point x and group element gamma, I have an edge from x to f gamma x, so this is a directed, a directed edge. x is a number of one to, from one to n, f gamma is a permutation, so f gamma x is a number, is another number from one to n, and this edge is labeled by the group element gamma that is producing this action. So it's just a way to describe the function f as a graph. Okay, this is also very simple. And now I make this measure interact with the graph as follows. So, so far it was a directed edge labeled graph. Now I will add weights to the edges as follows. The weight of the edge from X to F gamma X labeled gamma is the measure of the following set. I take all group elements such that this equation holds. This equation is ft of ft inverse gamma acting on x is like f gamma acting on x. This is something that should always, always holds if f is a homomorphism. Um, and the way I think about this set is that an element t of gamma is uh, supportive of the fact that this edge should be in the graph if this holds. Okay. And what you can probably intuitively see is that if the uniform, uh, the uniform defect of F is small, then this set should be large for every edge. So the weight of most edges is going to be close to one. And now I have this uh, graph representing the, the function and I have weights. Um, so here I just kept the definition of the weights. And here is what I said that if the uniform local defect of the function is small, then in this graph, almost all edges have weight close to one. So this should be quite intuitive. And the basic idea is to use those weights to deform F into a homomorphism. Um, so if I have a group element gamma and I'm looking at the permutation F gamma at the entry 
at the point x from one to n, I should probably change it if the weight of this edge is, is one of those rare edges whose weight is not close to one. Um, the, the, the precise process is, is, is a little complicated and I will not do it now, but the point is that the graph representing the function can interact with this left invariant measure. And then you can start doing uh, combinatorics and then some basic analysis um, to find the homomorphism of H. What questions? Or just confirmation that you're hearing? Is this a... Um, iterative process, or do you have a finite number of steps until you get a homomorphism? It's a um, it's a maybe five step process, so it's bounded. Thanks. It's it's, it's not iterative. Um, can you say a word how you change your graph and to make it into a homomorphism? Yes. Yeah, so. Yes, I will say, um, first of all, I look at this graph and all the low, all the edges which are not, which have weight not very close to one, I just remove them. And then I look at the remaining vertices and all the vertices that um, now, this measure allows me to have a notion of a, of a degree of a vertex. Uh, because right after I remove some edges, some of the vertices don't have all, don't have a, an outgoing edge for every gamma in gamma. So I can use this measure to, to have a degree, a notion of a degree. How many of the edges have remained after I remove the low weight edges? And so if I have, a low weight, uh, a low weight vertex. I also remove it, and then, well, I lied a little bit. But after you do it, if you do it in some clever way, those two steps that I said: first, remove the low weight edges, and then remove the edge, the, the vertices, which don't have many neighbors. Then what happens is that the remaining graph. Is, has the structure of a group point in the sense that if you have an edge from X to Y marked gamma one and from Y to Z marked gamma two, then this resulting graph also contains the edge from X to Z marked gamma two, gamma one. Um, so, and then you add vertices to complete it. Uh, yes, and once once you have once you have a group of it, it's 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 a purely algebraic uh, thing. But, is, but the magic is the you get a group of it. The measure is the magic is that you get a group of it, and yes, and and and, and the point is that there is some sub subtlety in how you remove the edges and then remove the the uh, the vertices. You need to remove the edges of weight one minus two epsilon but then only remove vertices uh, if the weight, uh, so low weight edges and vertices which have many low weight uh, outgoing edges, it's not the same concept of low weight. So this is the subtlety that enables us to, to create the group weight. You need like, you need very low weight and just low weight, uh, and then you, and then you get this group. Weight. So okay, sounds cool. Okay. Thanks. It's, it's, I, I try to make a slide about it, but I realize that uh, I'm not going to. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not going to be able to explain it. Okay. okay. Now I want to move from the amenable world to special linear groups. Um, I will be working here with the SLR Z, but uh, everything I'm saying is, is true for SLR. Uh, you can replace Z by the ring of integers of, uh, of a number field and it still works uh, with the same proof. So I just like my slides to have the simplest interesting example, but, um, but it doesn't have to be Z. Uh, and theorem is of the same type that 
if I have a function from SLRZ to seam M, then there is a homomorphism from SLRZ to seam a little more than M, um, such that uh, the distance between the homomorphism and the given function is at most some constant uh, times the uniform local defect where N is just a little larger than M. And the constant C does not depend on M. Uh, it actually only depends on, on uh, the rank, so on R. Um, in particular, as I said, if you, if you want to replace that by OK, then it will not change the C. Uh, because C only depends on R. So is SLRZ a minimal? No, SLRZ, SLRZ is, is not a minimal. It's actually, I mean, these groups are even as far from a minimal as, as you can have because they have a Kashdan's property T. So they are, in a sense, anti aminable um, but, but, still, but still you can do it. Uh, and I will be using the theorem about aminable groups in order to do it because um, Inside SLRZ, I have um, the group of uh, unipot unipotent groups inside, which are unipotent, and they are amenable. So this is the trick. And here, I'm doing it immediately. Uh, but before I start, I, I must say that this, this method that I'm going to show you now, it, we owe an intellectual debt to, uh, to Berger, Rosau, and Tom, uh, which did something similar in, in a different constant, context. Um, so, I restrict F to the subgroup U of upper triangular unipotent uh, matrices. Okay, so this is an important group, and uh, in particular, it's amenable. Um, and since it's amenable, I can apply the previous theorem and to this function F plus from the upper triangular unipotent group um, to seam N. And then, yeah, by the previous theorem, this F plus is close to homomorphism H plus. Uh, where M is a little, just a little larger. Um, but I don't even care that it's just a little larger here. Uh, you will see, but it's true. The, this M is just a little larger than M. So in particular, if I take, uh, so one plus EIJ is just uh, like an elementary, uh, elementary generator of SLRZ. If I take it to the power of m factorial, then, well, if I wrote h plus here, since h plus is a homomorphism, then this would be exactly the identity because it's, an homo it's a homomorphism into sim m. And f plus is close to h plus on all elements. So this is not necessarily the identity, but it's close to the identity because f plus is close to h plus. And therefore, I can just take the same elements and conjugate them by any element that you could think of. And again, it will be almost the identity because this is something not difficult to check. If you have, if F is almost the identity on some element and you conjugate it, then it's still almost the identity. Um, so this thing that uh, is obvious when F is a truly homomorphism is still carries out to, to approximate homomorphisms. The bottom line of this slide is now F is almost the identity on all conjugate of those elementary matrices to the power of N factorial. I'm just continuing with the proof and I just kept this bottom line. Now it's the top line. Um, so F almost the, the set of elements of this form, this elementary matrix to the power conjugated, is obviously conjugation invariant, right? Because I took all conjugate, so it's a conjugation invariant set. And also, obviously, it contains a non scalar matrix. Well, yeah, just a one plus E12, and you will there. But now, if I have a conjugation invariant subset of SLRZ that contains a non-scalar matrix, then we know that it generates a finite index normal subgroup of gamma and a bounded generation result. So it's a, 
paper by Witte Morris, where he credits this result to Carter, Kevin, and Page, says that this generation of the finite index subgroup by the set of elements of this form, or any other set of elements, which is conjugation, uh, which is preserved by conjugation and uh, contains a non-scalar matrix, the generation is very, very fast. Every element in this finite index subgroup is a product of elements in this set of at, at most some constant number of elements from this set. This constant that depends only on R, well in SLRZ. So very fast generation. So what does it say? That, what does it say that? Uh, sorry, what does it say that the generation is very fast? You have a, a set of elements where the where f is uniformly close to the identity, and every element in gamma is just a bounded product of them. So f is almost the identity on every element of gamma. This is the point because the generation is so fast. Okay, so we managed to deduce that F is almost the identity on a finite index subgroup uniformly, like the supremum of the distance of F from the identity on going over all elements of the finite index subgroup is, is very small. Now I can define just um, a map from the quotient to sim N using the original F. And the way that I do it is just, um, just choose arbitrary coset representatives, right? So F did not really factor through gamma, but I can define F bar by just choosing coset representatives. And this is a map from a finite group to sim N. So a finite group is again amenable and I can again apply the previous theorem to correct F bar into a homomorphism. Um, and once I do that, I get a homomorphism close to F bar, and then I lift it back to a map from SLRZ. And this lifting uh, gives me what I want because F almost vanishes on the terminal. And, and that, that finishes the proof. So it's two, use, two uses of the previous amenable theorem, one on the unipotent elements and the other on the finite quotient. So questions? So the dependence on R only comes from the bounded generation that you have. Number yes, of that's right. That's right. But here there is a use in the bounded generation. There's a use of the compactness theorem. So this C is is not not explicit for this reason. Uh -huh. And and you you believe that it is really it really depends on R or? Yes, but I don't really have a, a reason for this belief. I just believe it. Okay. Okay, so um, how am I with time? Uh, well, uh, uh, how much more do you have? I, mean, you... I have this slide. And I just, I ju I just, just uh, do this slide and then, and then concluding remark, I'll, I'll skip. Uh, okay, so you can do the slide. Okay. So or, what five. I want to say now, five minutes, okay. Uh, what I want to say now is that um, I sh once I showed, I began the, the talk with a negative result um, where we were not allowed to increase the dimension. And now, um, once I allow to increase the dimension, I, I showed you two positive results for amenable groups and for special linear groups. Um, so you might still think that uh, maybe uh, once you allow to add points, all groups are stable. This is not true. Um, uh, as we can show here. So you can let take gamma to be a group that subjects onto, let's say the free group F2. Just think about gamma being F2 itself. This is good enough. Then I have a sequence of functions from this F2, uh, free group on two elements to sim and K, such that the local defect goes to zero, but the global defect not only is bounded from zero, but it actually approaches one. Um, so it's really, really uh, not stable. You really have the um, even very small uh, 
uh, uniform defect uh, can leave, you can have very small uh, uniform defect even if you are very, very far from every homomorphism. Uh, I will not give you the construction, but the point is that you can construct those maps FK such that they have very small local defect, but they satisfy what's written here. So what is written here? FK on this element, which I'm going to talk about, is very far from the identity. And what is this element? It's just some constant in the group times n squared times another constant in the group to the power of some constant um, to gamma one to, to, another, to this, another constant in the group minus C. Um, and this holds for every capital N, which is at least NK. You wrote the N factorial. Uh, Did you mean N factorial or N? They just the identity. Or is it? Identity? No, in N. No, you wrote gamma, gamma, gamma zero to the N factorial? Yes. Uh, you did you did mean n factorial, but but here gamma is not in n factorial, it's in nk, right? This is the reason I don't is it um, gamma zero to the n factorial always the identity? I think gamma zero is in the free group. Yes, this is in the free group. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. But you are right, but this is but what you're saying is the point. If fk was a homomorphism, then this would be the trivial, this would be mapped to the trivial element. Right, because then you can get fk gamma zero to the n factorial, which will be just zero, and then you'll get here gamma one to the c, gamma one to the minus c. Um, but fk is not a homomorphism, and we are able to make it, this is something that should be, that should hold for in every symmet group of size n, but we make f that grossly violates it. So it cannot be close to a true homomorphism. Yeah, is that clear? Okay, I, I would assume yes. Or, or that, yeah, yeah. Qu quite okay, yeah. Yeah, so I just, I get, I take some relation that holds in the symmetry group and I make a function with small uniform local defect that really violates it. Just, this should be zero and I make it very close to one. Um, so this is the method. And um, yeah, we can ask if this is true for uh, non-elementary hyperbolic groups in general. And um, I will not talk about it, but we discuss a little bit in the paper why you could expect that maybe you can generalize this negative result um, to these hyperbolic groups. There is also a relation to computer science and I'm skipping it but it's also in the paper. One thing that I want to tell you here is that Alex Tuboski has been running a seminar about uh, pointwise stability. Uh, and there are over 20 talks recorded. It's uh, on the IAS YouTube channel. Um, and uh, yeah, so I also worked a lot in, in this field um, of pointwise stability. But um, yeah, just not, not to cause confusion, what we talked about now is uniform stability. So there are two notions of stability or homomorphism of for formulating the fact that approximate homomorphisms are close to homomorphisms. Um, there are two notions. Um, and it's interesting if we can discover if there's any interaction between them. Um, um, yeah, so just... Uh, In this IS seminar of Alex, yeah, there, there have been many talks about applications of, uh, of this pointwise stability. And I would just mention that this Gauss Hatami theorem about stability of homomorphisms into unitary group uh, with respect to the normalized Hilbert Schmidt norm was used uh, in the recent refutation of the column embedding problem. So, this is a crucial ingredient there. Um, they do it through complexity theory and they use this stability result to show that um, uh, for, so for some games played in the quantum world, approximately optimal strategies must be close to optimal strategies. And from there, they 
uh, we build up the result with, with many other ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Oren. Very nice talk. Uh,